introduction to the system specification for a 61850 system from a standards perspective. I will start with explaining some general elements that you have to consider when you specify a substation. We'll then talk a little bit about product requirements and 61850. So what is provided in 61850 with regard to product requirements. We will discuss the aspects of your specification that have an imp that are influenced by 61850. We will explain in more details how you can specify using 61850. 61850 provides certain capabilities to support a specification as well in a machine processable way. We will discuss that. We then will also look a little bit at what advanced specification possibilities you have with 61850 and then we will talk about the new technical report IC 61850-600 what he will provide a quick overview more details will be provided by Jörg in his presentation and finally as an outlook what other ideas do we have in the standards community for specification when we start the specification, the first thing that you need to understand is, is it a new substation? Is it a retrofit substation? Of course, the level of freedom that you have is quite different in a new substation than when you have a retrofit. In a retrofit, the complete substation as such typically is there. You do a retrofit of your protection and control system, which means that the specification that you are doing is more or less a standalone specification for your substation automation protection and control system. Existing boundaries need to be considered, boundaries like what is the primary technology. If you have the sensors there, you will not be able to choose non-conventional sensors, but also physical constraints like the cable ducts that you may have in your substation. That has also an impact on, on your considerations. When you have a completely new substation, you have the full freedom of defining what you want. The specification for your substation automation protection and control system will be only part of the overall substation specification. That will be a much larger specification that has to be done. But on the other side, you have more flexibility in the design choices. This flexibility you can restrict by your specification or it can be kept as an option for the design. When we look at a few features of IC61850 and later on we will see they somehow impact the specification. IC61850 is providing interoperability between IDs. That's one of the key features of 61850 to provide interoperability between the different equipments that you use in your system. We define standardized data access to IEDs, so there's communication methods, communication concepts and protocols described how you can access the information in your IEDs. SIG2850 also includes a standardized object-oriented data model that will be one of the key elements when we discuss specifications later on. On the other side, 61850 doesn't make any prescriptions, requirements on how you structure your, info, your functionality into different devices. So 61850 basically supports a free allocation of the functions to the IEDs. We are using in 61850 mainstream communication stack like MMS, Manufacturing Message System, or TCP IP and Ethernet standard communication technology used everywhere and, and uh, that will be one uh, an important point when we discuss specification 61850 provides a standardized engineering through the substation configuration description language now when we look at the specification for a substation in general what do we need to specify and that's independent of 61850 that's just imagine you have to build a new substation, what do you need to specify to your contractor so that you get what you want? Of course, you have to specify the single line diagram of your substation. You have to specify details of the switch gear, requirements on the switch gear. Then, of course, the complete 
protection control and automation system that you have, you need to specify the function requirements, but as well product requirements, requirements on equipment. Um, you will integrate your substage with your SCADA system, so you have to specify what is the signals that have to go to the SCADA system, what is the communication towards your SCADA system, is it 101, is it 104, is, are you using 6150, DMP3, there's quite some variation that exists that you have to specify. The physical arrangements of the switch yard, associated buildings, if it's an air insulated switch yard as an example, where do you have control buildings, which equipment shall be located where, if you are using merging units with non-conventional sensors, where shall the merging units be placed, that needs to be specified. Testing, testing is always an important point. How do you want to test your substation? Acceptance testing is only one part, but which kind of maintenance tests do you need to do across the life of your substation? Routine tests, certain requirements on virtual isolation, on isolation in general to do testing in a life environment, but also how will you test upgrades or replacement of equipment? All this needs to be considered and specified. Then talking about 61850, where we have to define and configure a complete system. You also need to define who will be responsible to do what in the overall project realization. And finally, the interaction of your substation with the rest of the power system, communication to the SCADA we already mentioned, but your substation may also have interfaces to the remote end of a power line for line differential protection, for protection acceleration schemes that need to be specified, but also access from a maintenance system. Maybe you want to do a remote upgrade of your IDs. Maybe you want to retrieve disturbance records. All these interfaces need to be specified. And the large amount of that is independent of 650 to a certain level. So, yeah, not everything is impacted by 6150, but the focus of this workshop that we are doing today will really be on the elements that are affected or supported by IC6150. So in this slide, I try to highlight a little bit from the previous list what is impacted by 6150 or what can be represented in 6150, as I already mentioned. It's not only that 61850 has an impact on what you have to specify, but 61850 is also helping you to do that specification. So one of the first elements is the single line diagram. We will see later on, we have the possibility to represent using the system configuration language from 61850 to describe the single line diagram, the topology of your substation. Switch gear details and requirements we cannot describe in 6150, but you need to consider them. You need to decide are you using non conventional CTs or VTs, and in that case, you have to specify that and it has consequences on your communication architecture. For sure, all the functional requirements on your protection, control, and automation system need to be specified. This has a significant impact on the data models on the elements that you need in your devices. Equipment requirements for your protection, control and automation system, uh, we will see later on. 6250 provides certain parts of the standard that specify equipment requirements, you can refer to those. SCADA communication is another important aspect from a 6250 perspective. You need to specify what signals have to go to the SCADA, what things have to go to your local HMI. Um, the signal list associated to these signals can be a 61850 data model subset, so that's a possibility to specify that in 61850. Physical arrangements of your switchyard, associated buildings is out of scope, we don't really care for that currently in 61850. Testing requirements we need to consider, in particular if we have process bus configurations, if we 
have to do live testing in a live system that needs to be specified. Project realization in the 6150 world, we'll talk about that later, the different roles. It's another important element. Who is responsible to do what? Who is system integrator? What is the utility doing? What is your system integrator doing if you have one? And what is the responsibility of the product supplier? And last but not least, as already mentioned, the interaction of the substation with the rest of the power system is also something. Of course, there are interfaces. These interfaces may be compliant to 6150, so they have to be uh, considered as well. Many cases we say that we recommend to do a functional specification. Now, what does this mean? A functional specification of a 61850 based system. What do we need to address? The single line diagram we already discussed, the functional requirements, that's of course the key elements. But we may need to add certain elements. We need to add requirements on interfaces. What is the process interface? How is your switch gear connected? Does it have a process bus interface? Are you using non-conventional CTVTs that provide sample values? The interface to the SCADA system, are we using 101, 104, and how are we mapping the signals? Are we using DMP3? Needs to be specified as well. Service and maintenance access, do we want to do remote upgrade of uh, IDs, download a new software version as an example, download new configurations. Uh, do you have a need to do this access? Do you need to have an access to retrieve disturbance records or whatever you have? So that needs to be specified. Then you may specify certain constraints, constraints in terms of physical constraints, which equipment need to be where, where do you have the operator room, bay houses, uh, power supply system may need to be specified. Do I need to supervise that? Is there information to bring in my system? And last but not least, you may reuse existing non 6150 compliant components, some um, particular fault recorders, disturbance recorders that you may want to integrate. So you have to specify as well how to integrate this non 6150 compliant components. You have to specify reliability, availability, maintainability, and performance requirements of your system. Now, as we already discussed, not everything is impacted by 61850. Where do we have an impact from 61850? Our communication architecture for sure is impacted by 61850. We need to have a communication architecture for our devices that complies with 61850. An Ethernet work, we can decide how we separate process bus, station bus, as already discussed. Function integration, what functions do we integrate in which devices? You can optionally specify. Object models, instead of just supplying a signal list of the information you want to get to the SCADA system, you also have the option to specify a 6150 data model a complete 6250 data model, so that's something that you can do. Naming conventions, we have many names in our systems. We may specify how these names, what naming conventions we shall fulfill. Communication services, 6250 offers a variety of communication service. You may or may not require all of them, so you have to specify which ones you are requiring from what device. The engineering process, I already mentioned it, and I will just ask it, discuss it later. An element, an important aspect, who is responsible for what in the overall design process? What tools are you using? What tool is responsible for what? And then at the end also, what are your requirements on the tools? As an example, is the requirement that the ID supplier supplies you as well the ID configuration tool as part of his delivery? Or when you have a system integrator, shall the system integrator provide you the tool that he has used to do the system integration? Shall he provide you the system integrator, the files associated with that, like a system configuration description file? But also, shall he supply to you 
the complete project file, that may be a tool internal one, including a tool. That's important when you will do later on the maintenance of the system yourself and don't want to rely on the system configurator for that. And with that, I come to the roles in the 6150 project. We talked, what you see at the bottom here, about the system integrator. That's a key role in the 6150 project. It's basically the person or the, 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 the entity that links the requirements from you as an end user with the products that you are using and make sure that this integrated system fulfills the requirement that you have specified. Besides that, you have, of course, the product vendor, which is responsible to supply the individual product. You may ask that one to be responsible to configure the products, but very often the system integrator will do that. And then, of course, we have you as the end user. You create the specification. You also decide what is the requirements that you accept the final delivery of the system. This assumes that the system integrator is an independent person. In reality, a system integrator can be one of the product suppliers. That's done very often. But it can also be yourself as end user that decide to make the integration yourself. In that case, you just buy the products that fulfill the requirements that you need and you are responsible to build the complete system. Uh, this is a list of typical responsibilities of the system integrator. The system integrator may or may not select the IDs. When you have a third-party system integrator, you may tell to the system integrator what IDs to use. Uh, but in some cases, it can also be the system integrator that has the freedom to choose what he wants to use based on his experience. Uh, when you just provided the signal list of the signals you need to send to the SCADA system, the system integrator will have to convert that into the 6150 data model, has to identify what signals out of the data model need to be communicated. The communication network um, can be designed by the system integrator. On the other side, you may already have made certain specifications, certain assumptions. The detailed design of the schemes, protection control schemes, sometimes it's done by the system integrator. In some cases, you as an end user may want to provide already more details how to implement your schemes. Definitely based on the schemes, the system integration integrator has to engineer the information flow, control blocks, data sets associated to that. Hopefully the tool is supporting that. System integrator at the end needs to verify the communication architecture that he has chosen or that you have required, needs to verify is performance wise, is it possible to do everything? We are using, and depending on the architecture with sampled values, will there not be an overload? So that needs to be analyzed and demonstrated to you as an end customer that the system fulfills and is able to deal with your requirements. And last but not least, the test specification to verify the behavior and the performance of the system. It can be defined by the system integrator and you will then test against it. But of course, you first need to verify if it fulfills your requirements. Other option is that you provide this test specification that at the end you will test against the system to see if the system does what you expect it to do. Another challenging point is now how to how deep in the details do you want to go when you do a specification? From a general perspective, you can limit your specification completely to specify functional requirements. In that case, the system integrator should try to optimize the system he builds to fulfill your functional requirements. Nevertheless, if you do that, there may be that when you have three projects with different system integrators, with slightly different requirements, the solution that you get at the end 
may look quite different from one to the next. So in order to standardize in your projects, you may want to provide additional non-functional requirements. As an example, you may want to provide requirements how you structure your communication network. If you have a process bus, do your merging units, are they connected to an independent network? Or are they connected to the station bus? Is there a global process bus? Or do we have segments per base, per sub-elements of your substation? All these kind of restrictions. Also, do you have a star topology, a ring topology? All these kind of restrictions you may want to specify in order to avoid that each and every project is different. So it's in order to achieve a certain level of standardization across your projects, you may go beyond specifying functional requirements. Next aspect is as well, uh, are you doing a specification for a particular project or are you doing a specification for a long-term contract? That's also something that you need to consider because it may have different influences on what exactly you are, have to specify. One choice is to do a split of your specification to create something like a generic uh, specification with functional and non-functional requirements that is completely independent of a project. So there you put all your generic requirements and then you make a second part of the specification where you put project specific requirements. So the first part you will reuse every time. The second part you will do on a per project basis. Based on the first part, you can make frame agreements with your suppliers. So that's also an advantage of that approach. Next, I want to spend a few words about product requirements that you may have and how they relate to IC6250. This is a little bit beyond the standard, it's, it's more the general aspects of your product. There's two parts in IC6250 that address those topics. One of that is the 6250-3, the part 3, which is talking about environmental conditions, environmental requirements, uh, things like uh, temperature range of your devices, but also EMC requirements. Um, as it's illustrated here, it's not something that has been invented by the IC6250 standard. It's mainly a list of references to existing standards from the industry, like uh, 6870-4 for reliability requirements, 6100-6-5 for all the EMC requirements, then 6872.1 for power supply and 2.2 for environmental requirements. So that's where you find requirements specified that apply to your general products that you may want to specify. So you can refer to the IC6250-3 for a lot of that. Another part that goes a little bit in this more generic requirement stuff is the Part 6850-4, which mainly talks about the engineering process. Then, yeah, not the engineering process as such, but mainly about the, the product life cycles, these kind of things, general requirements on product maintenance. So, in this standard, there is some statements like that version identification should be required for hardware, software, and tools. Also some statements about products and model number, what should be done when the model number is the same. Uh, but also some interesting aspects about discontinuation of the product and how long they, a vendor needs to guarantee a supply of the project after this continuation. Uh, so also about agreements for product support after this continuation of, this, of the product. Uh, which can be something like uh, agreement that you have five years for compatible products for extension or ten years for spare parts and repairs. But the, this part really describes that in a very global way 
gives you a little bit ideas what as an end user, what as a customer of your products, what you may need to agree with your vendor of the products. Okay, after these few words about product requirements, now let's really get started to look into the specification aspects that are influenced by 61850. As I've shown in the first part of my presentation, when you look at the general specification of a system, not everything is really affected by IC61850, but there's a few parts where IC61850 plays a role. And that's what I want to address now in this chapter. So first of all, uh, performance and availability requirements that we have will certainly have an impact on the communication architecture. So it's important that you specify those requirements. So the topic here is everything about communication architecture. Communication architecture may be specified in your requirements. So you may specify that you want to do a ring topology, a star topology, that your process bus is bay local only and you have a global station-wide bus. All these kind of requirements you may specify but when you specify that, that may restrict optimization from the system integrator, but on the other side, you have a certain guarantee that all your systems will look similar. So it's your choice to decide how far you want to go here. We will also discuss communication architecture in a little bit more details later this afternoon in one or in another presentation. Communication equipment, of course, is also an important element uh, with 61850 having a Ethernet based substation communication. You may want to have certain requirements on the communication equipment that you are using, your Ethernet switches. There you can have a similar approach like you have for your protection IDs or for your bay controllers. You can specify dedicated products that you want to be integrated included or you can leave it open to the system integrator to decide what communication equipment he wants to use. Function integration. Function integration is another topic. I think I already mentioned it. IC61850 doesn't standardize any products. So the function integration, how far you want to go, what shall be combined in one device is completely open. As a user, you may want to specify certain requirements. You may have some requirements that certain functions shall be in independent devices to avoid uh, uh, error scenarios that when something fails, you lose too much. But you may also specify that certain functions shall be in the same device to avoid dependency from communication uh, networks. So. You may think about specifying certain constraints on function allocation. Object models and naming conventions, an additional element. Uh, as already mentioned, IC6150 has a standardized data model, which is implicitly specified by specifying the function requirements. Uh, so basically, it can be used as a replacement of the signal list. When you only supply a signal list, it's uh, reverse engineering that needs to be done by the probably the system integrator. But you also need to specify what optional data you may want to use. Again, we will have this afternoon an additional uh, element in our workshop where we will dis discuss a little bit the aspects of data modeling, object models, uh, and requirements. Uh, as you may know, 61850 is using a hierarchical structure, the logical nodes that, that are the key elements of the data model, the functional elements, are grouped into logic devices. In principle, you don't need to specify that. On the other side, it again may be an option to standardize again on your data model, but it also has an impact on your testing requirements. So also there you may want to do certain specifications in terms of how logic devices shall be structured. Naming conventions, another important thing. Today now we have a few 
IDs that support flexible naming of the data model. In that case, you may want to have certain requirements how the naming shall be done. But naming is not only in the data model, naming is also in your engineering environment. Circuit breakers have a name. When you look at your substation uh, topology, the equipment has names, but you also have description attributes that you can add. So there's a multiple places where you have names that you may want to specify to be applied. So you need to think about a certain naming convention that you want to use in your system. Communication services, another interesting topic. 6150 supports multiple communication service. Not all of them are mandatory. In principle, it's a um, fact of the ID developer to decide what services are supported. But it's also you as a user has to specify what services are required. Most of the services are typically given. I mean, all the MMS services like control services, reporting, that's standard support that is available. One of the services that may not be always there is the log, the log services. So in certain cases, when you require logs, it may be wise to consider to specify that you require that. Um, even when you will not use certain services at the moment, that may be important for future extensions. The log service that I just mentioned by the base service is typically used for an alternate way to store events instead of buffered reporting. In most cases today, you will use buffered reporting. However, the log service also can be used to do statistic evaluation of certain data. So if you want to do in the future a statistic analysis of your measured values, temperature values on the power transformer as an example, the history of those values over a certain period, that can also use the log service. So it may be future proof to request the support of the log service even if you don't have an immediate need today. Service tracking is another one that needs the log service. Last but not least, you have to specify the data that you want to communicate towards local HMI to the station controller and the gateway. This can be defined by specifying data sets referred to in control blocks. That's the way how it will be implemented. Typically, when you do a formal specification, you can configure those elements as inputs to the logical node representing the HMI. But definitely, you have a way to specify that as well in IC61850. Engineering process and tools, another very interesting topic. As we already mentioned earlier, it's important that when you define a 61850 based project, you also define the roles. By the way, that's not only important for 61850, I think it's also important for other projects. You define the roles of the, of the different actors, who has to do what, and the responsibilities. Roles is typically the device vendor, the system integrator, and yourself. You should somehow define what you expect the device vendor to do, what you expect the system integrator to do, and what will be in your responsibility. Uh, the system integrator, as already mentioned earlier, his typical task is to integrate all the components that you have specified in a way that they fulfill the requirements that you have specified as part of your system specification. Tools is another important element. We, as you know, there is, uh, that, there is this engineering process defined in IC61850 with the system configuration language. And as such, tools play an important role there. So it's also wise to define the requirements on the tool. What tools are you expecting that you get? I think it's a given that from an ID vendor, you will get the ID configuration tool, and this shall be 6250 compliant, and it shall support the process, the engineering process, based on 6250 the way you like it to be. There is some variations, 
The question is then about the system tool. If you are not doing the integration yourself, the system tool will be used by the system integrator, but still you may want to get the database produced by the system tool, including the system configuration description file, which is the result in terms of 61850 system configuration language of the engineering process. You definitely want to ask to get that from your integrator. But you may also want to get from your integrator the engineering tool itself that he was using, including the database, because that's a key element that later on you can do the maintenance of the system yourself, if you want so. Otherwise, you will be dependent on the integrator for future modifications. Okay, so now that we have addressed a little bit these various elements that are affected by IEC 61850. Let's have a final look at an example of a specification, and this is a pure document version of a specification. In the next part, we will discuss a little bit a software-based uh, machine processable representation of the specification. But from a document perspective, what you want to do is to start as an example. You will provide in your document a system overview which is the overview on the system that you are specifying, to be the single line diagram of the substation, but also secondary equipment that you need. We have main one, main two protection, is there a backup protection, is the bay controller part of the protection, is it independent? So all this overview of the system, how you would like to have it, needs to be specified. Then with regard to the communication network, you may want to specify topology, you may want to spe specify how the communication network is managed. Are you using SNMP network management protocol or do you, would you prefer to have it managed as part of the 61850 system? That's typically the options you have. Interfaces, interfaces to your system, the external system, like the interface for the control center, <laughs> event and disturbance recorded data, and so on. But you also have internal interfaces, interfaces between the devices within the substation, but also interfaces to legacy devices, like uh, an existing uh, data recorder that you want to use. So all these interfaces need to be specified. Next, of course, you have to specify functional requirements for your substation. This is probably even if it's only one line here, that's probably the, the largest piece of your specification that you have to write down to describe exactly what are your functional requirements. Uh, you may consider a chapter in your specification dealing with the realization, what I call conform to 61850, so all the aspects specific to 61850. Communication architects we already discussed, object model, you may want to specify the object model, communication services, naming conventions, degree of function integration, ID qualification, what is the process to select the IDs if you don't provide all of them as a requirement, requirements on the engineering process as we have discussed, but also requirements on devices, the PICS protocol implementation conformance statements according to 61850. That's where you can specify what services are you requiring, model implementation, conformance statements, and some other stuff. Last but not least, your specification needs to contain elements like discussing information security, implementation requirements, so that's more or less independent of 61850, your reliability, availability, maintainability requirement, the RAMs, performance requirement, testing requirements, what kind of tests do we need to do later on? Do we have certain requirements on live testing of the system? That needs to be specified. Then another important point that is very often forgotten, capacity requirements with the viewpoint of expandability of your system, upgrade of your system. So if you start with a small project that has two feeders, but you know 
In the future, there will be a substation with 40 or 50 feeders that needs to be taken into consideration. So if you leave the architecture open, that's a good view to put that in the requirement specification so that the integrator knows that the network, the system needs to be designed for, <coughs> for more data. Expandability, planned extensions, that goes a little bit in that direction, but it's also important from a scheme implementation perspective. If you have some um, interlocking schemes, some blocking schemes, when you add later on base, that has an impact on your goose configuration, so it may be wise to already foresee that, so that design is made that it can add this additional base without the need to retest everything because you have to reconfigure everything. That's something important to keep in mind. Upgrade discusses how to handle hardware software upgrade. If your ID vendor has suddenly a new hardware release and you have to deploy it, how do you deploy it? How do you test it before you put the system on power again? Also that may need to be specified because it has an impact on the whole design on in particular, we have goose messaging sample values, the, the whole aspects of virtual isolation, and so it is an important element to be known by the system integrator what he has to expect, what the system has to be designed for. Then, of course, migration, migration plans. If it's a brownfield substation, so not everything is from scratch. You may have strategies which base are first to be replaced. How do you deal when you start to use goose messaging, but you have all base that don't supply yet the goose? What is the migration strategies here? So that's also important elements that you need to put in your specification. As mentioned earlier, IC61850 not only needs to be considered when we do a specification, IC61850 offers through the system configuration language as well uh, possibility to express certain aspects of a specification in a formal machine processable way. How this is done, we will now have a look in this next part of this presentation. This is a quick reminder on the IC61850 engineering process and the system configuration language. Uh, the engineering process basically contains several steps and allows us that we can start with a system specification, which is a formal way to express our specification in SCL. On the other side, a vendor that has an ID that is supporting IC61850 will provide a device capability description file from the device. So the system specification file the different device capability files from the devices that I plan to use in the system will then be used when I create my project using a system design or system configuration tool. At the end of the design process, the system configuration tool can produce what we call the substation configuration description, which is the final SCL file that is then used by the various ID tools, imported into the various ID tools, and based on that, the ID configuration is made, and once all the IDs are configured, <coughs> we really get our configured system. Now, what is possible to be described in the system configuration language today? First of all, it's the as some aspects of the functionality of the system. We cannot describe the full functionality yet, but at least some of the key elements of the functionality can be described, which is, first of all, the single line diagram, the topology of the system. It is the process hierarchy. I can describe a process hierarchy. I also can describe a function subfunction hierarchy. We also can describe communication aspects communication network configuration to some level, and most importantly, information exchange. If you are using goose messaging as an example, in the system configuration language, we can configure 
the control blocks, the data sets that are associated with the Goose communication. We also can configure reporting, but of course, from the communication perspective, it's also possible to configure addressing information. With regard to the devices in my system, I can describe the configuration of the IEDs with the data model, the configuration of communication parameters as well. A vendor that is providing an ID, ISCD file, an ID capability description file, also can describe capabilities in terms of engineering flexibility, <coughs> what is possible, what is still supported by the devices. And last but not least, we also can describe the link between the functions that we realized in the IED and the primary process, the IED controls. This provides an overview of the different elements that we will find in a system configuration file. We have a part that we typically call substation section, or also the function specification part. That's where we express device independently the topology of the substation, the single line diagram, but also the structure in terms of uh, voltage levels, base, conducting equipment. But there we can also associate functions, sub-functions, uh, or processes. We then have, for each of our IDs in the final project, we have what we call an ID section that mainly describes the data model of the ID, communication configurations like control blocks, but also the capabilities of the IDs in what we call the service section that describe what the ID is able to, to, to do in terms of communication services but also what engineering flexibility is supported by the IED. We then have a communication section. That's where we have everything described related to the communication. So that's where we find our communication addresses, both IP addresses for the devices, for the different uh, interfaces of the devices to the communication network. But that's, that's also where we find communication parameters for goose messages, the MAC address as an example of a goose message that's found there as well. We finally have a section that is called data type template section. That's where we will find all the data types that are reused in the IED models. So this is more a, an element that is automatically produced. There's not so much manual configuration to be done there. A specification in SCL, now what can we really express when we do a specification? As mentioned, according to IC61850, we can create what we call a system specification description file, SSD. And the tool that we use for that is called system specification tool. Based on what we have learned before, what is contained in a SCL file, apparently we can express the single line diagram, the structure of our substation in voltage levels, base, with connecting equipment and showing the connections between the connecting, connecting, connecting equipment or substation equipment like switches or sensors. We also can express functional requirements to certain level, mainly by associating logical nodes which represent the functional elements. We can associate logical nodes to the elements of the single line diagram. As an example, we can associate a NIC CBR and a CSWI to a breaker. With that, we express that we require the information from the breaker from a functionality perspective, but that the breaker is also remotely controllable by providing the logical node CSWI, which is the control function of a circuit breaker or a switch. If you want to go in more details, we can also specify the detailed signal list that we expect from the substation to be communicated as an example through the gateway to the remote SCADA. In order to do so, we can specify the detailed 
data model for the various logical nodes that we have already added from our function perspective. We can now define the detailed model as well, and we can then associate signals that we want to use, for, that we want to communicate from a certain function to the SCADA. We can select those signals, associate them to a SCADA interface, as an example, to a gateway, the logical node representing the gateway, and with that we can express our requirements from a signal list in a formal way. This slide summarizes how that whole can look using a tool and creating the result of the tool in, a, in an SS, SSD file. So on top left here, we see the capture of an example of a single line diagram of our substation with the current transformers, the breakers as conducting equipment connected to each other. This is expressed in the resulting SL file, which is XML based. We see the structure of a voltage level, a bay for the bus bar with a name, a bay in this example, the bay Q01, with certain logical nodes associated that represent the functionality that we can describe, but then also the conducting equipment, like a disconnecting switch with the name QB1, which would be this one here associated to that certain sort of logical nodes expressing a functionality again we see those here through the terminals and connectivity nodes we can also express the topology so that's the typical way how a function specification can be described in SCL so we can describe the topology logical nodes associated to the different elements and as mentioned we can also describe the detailed data models behind these logical nodes so to summarize what we are doing in the context of our system configuration language during the specification we take our specification tool we produce what we call an ssd or substation specification description file and basically, when we look at the overall SCL file during this step of the design and specification process, we mainly create what we call the substation element of our future complete SCL file. In the previous part, we looked at the basic capabilities supported by IC61850 to do a formal specification. Uh, in this next part now, we will look at some additional possibilities that can be done as well. There is a desire from various utilities that they would like to standardize on IC6250 implementations and as such would like to specify more details. Specify more details like communication architectures, specify as well allocation of functions to devices, uh, specify a detailed implementation of the protection control and automation schemes, including the data flow. Uh, so basically include specification of input requirements for ID functions, but also specify of signals to be transmitted to the SCADA and to local HMI, maybe including the mapping of the, those signals on a SCADA communication like the HM5101 that they may be using. So mapping between the 6150 data model and the data points of their SCADA communication. Maybe also ID requirements according to 61850. So which services should be supported, engineering flexibility. So all this is typically desired to be able to specify as well in a formal way. Now, how can this be done? What is possible already today with the base IC61850 is to do that by creating a substation configuration description file, but using virtual IDs instead of the real IDs that you may use later on in the project realization. So that, with that possibility, you can do a completely device independent design of your substation automation system.
The first step to do when we have already created the function specification explained in the previous part. So we created our functions, we defined the logical nodes that we need as an example associated to a current transformer, but also protection functions like shown here. So once this is done, the next step that we may be able to do is to introduce so-called virtual IDs, like here a virtual ID protection unit one, switch control unit one, bay control unit, merging unit, and then allocate all our functions that we had specified to the virtual IDs. So here we express the protection unit, implements all these protection functions that we have specified, but it shall also implement breaker failure function, reclosing function, and synchro check. What we see here, those functions are associated to the circuit breaker. This is just the protection function on the bay. Or another example, the switch control unit shall realize the interface to the switches and circuit breakers, while the bay control unit shall implement the control, including interlocking of these switches. So that way we can allocate our functions to the virtual IDs. It's then also possible out of that to create directly an ID template as an ICD file, if you want to do that for the virtual ID. Next step then would be based on these ID templates now to create real virtual IDs, real instances of these virtual IDs, and then we can allocate those virtual IDs to the communication network. We can completely describe our communication network, our communication topology, in this case explained as a star network with the different bays where we have the IDs from the different bays uh, where we can express that. So this is possible to be done instead being based on real ICD files, based on our ICD files we created from our virtual IDs that we have specified by allocating the functions. And then we can do a complete configuration of the substation like we would do it with real devices, but at the end of the day, it's a configuration of the substation using virtual devices. But this allows us to do a complete description of the system. And it's also an important nice feature to later on use that uh, as an example to simulate my complete design before I really deploy it. There's a vari variety of simulation tools available on the market that allow you to do a function simulation of a substation design based on SCL. Uh, when we talk about scheme implementations, so already today, some tools allow to specify single flow independent of IDs. So using 61850 part six only, a single flow can be described using virtual IDs and external references to the IDs, uh, like we do it later on in a real design, but we have to use virtual IDs. Optionally, we can already configure then the goose messages as well as discussed before. Talking about single flow to the SCADA, to the gateway or the local HMI, also that can be described specify can be specified by creating external references on the ID that represents the local HMI, so that the ID that has the logic node IHMI, or the one that has the logic node ITCI for the teleprotection gateway. So basically we can specify the signal flow to these uh, devices by creating extracts and connecting all the data that we want to have reported in that case uh, through the gateway. Optionally, it's of course as well possible to configure the report control blocks already at this stage for the virtual IDs. Communication towards the network control center. As an example, if you are using uh, 870-5101-104 as communication to the network control center. Um, there is a standard that describes the mapping between 
875-101-104 and the IC61850. It describes the mapping in terms of uh, services, how the services are mapped, 6150 services on 875-101 services, mainly control service mapping is described in detail. It also describes a conceptual architecture of the gateway and it also describes mapping of the information model. This is, as I mentioned, the technical specification as part of the 6150 series. From a specification perspective, what is of interest here is that with regards to the mapping of the information model, it includes um, extension to the system configuration language, to the SCL, that allows us to describe the mapping between our 61850 model and the 101-104 uh, data model. So as an example, we may have in our 61850 model a data object in a logical node, in this case the DJIO called SPS01. We have the data attribute STVAL. And then with this private element of the type 1675-104, we have the possibility to express the 6870 104, uh, 6870-104 address that is used to transmit the information that we find behind this data point in the 61850 world. So in that case, it would be the 104 common address of ASDU number one, the internal object address 1010 and the type identification. So that's the element from the 874-101-104 model used, the type identifier 30. So with that, we can specify completely in SCL how our 6150 data points will be mapped onto 875-101-104 communication scheme. This is not only existing for uh, 875-101-104, there exists as well an IEEE standard that does something similar for DMP3. Uh, and we are currently also working on a similar way to describe mapping on Modbus. Okay, so with that we have more or less done everything what is what or described everything that can be done in terms of specification using the core part six of the standard as there is a desire to be able to do a little bit more we are currently working on a technical report 61850-6-100 that specifies certain extension to the scl that gives us that provide us even more flexibility in terms of uh, specification of, uh, of, of formal specification. The first thing is, as you mentioned before, when we want to describe interactions between functions, so the implementation of schemes today, without that we have already IDs in the system, we need to do that using virtual IDs. In order to not require virtual IDs, we went in this part 6100 a step further. So we added the possibility to, uh, to describe signal flow between the elements that we specify in our function part of the SCL. And we do that by introducing what we call source references. So while so far, we have to use external references, XREFs, between the logical nodes implemented in IDs. This allows us now to do as well signal flow between the logical nodes from the function specification, so we are not required to create IDs. We can directly create source references between the logical nodes from the function specification. Later on, those will then be translated into XREFs to describe the real interaction. So with that, we have the possibility to do a specification of control and protection schemes independent of an implementation in an ID.
A second thing is um, to allow us as well to produce ID specification requirements. That's a new file type that we introduce. So this is based on the approach for virtual IDs, where we have already seen before that our supports allocation of functions to devices without referencing a particular ID brand. And what is now possible as well is to create as a result of that what we call ISD files or ID specification description files. And you can use that as part of a tender where you, as an example, want to make your five-year contract for your IDs. So you can make your typical system designs, you can create virtual IDs, and then you have a, a new way to formally express the specification of an ID of ID requirements using an ISD file. This is also described in the part 6-100. Semantic improvement is also something that was introduced with the 6-100. Um, as we know from the standard, we have certain logical node classes that describe a certain functional element, like um, PTOC, that is a overcurrent element, or a PDIS, that is a distance element. But typically in the real world, you have some variations of that. And today, it's hard to understand when I have in a, in a device model 10 different PTOCs, which one is the restricted earth fold element, which one is the the phase element and so on. So that's not necessarily easier. If you have multiple phases, it's also not easy to describe which one is what what phase, what 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 elements. So with that we introduced the possibility to embed logical nodes in a function hierarchy. So instead of having all the logical nodes flat at Bay level as an example, we can embed the logical nodes in a function higher in a function subfunction hierarchy, and with that we can provide additional semantic information. So as an example shown here, we have now a function called distance protection that we define. We have a subfunction for switch on to fault where we allocate a logical node of the class. Piece of we this can describe this subfunction that this is the backward zone. We can have the forward switch on to fault with an additional logical node piece of. We then have um, the zone one, which is single phase. We have the, the a distance zone for the phases for two and three phases. We have addition zone, so we can here structure our function into subfunctions, providing with the text explanations, and then these functions have also certain types. It could also be imagined in the future to standardize on these function and subfunction types to further improve the semantic that we have. Another aspect that has been introduced with this 6100 is the introduction of what we call application schemes. When you look at the, at the project realization, you have typically your function elements, like a circuit breaker function, which is providing the interface to the circuit breaker. You may have a certain protection function. You may have a breaker failure function element. All these functional elements typically may participate in multiple applications. As an example, the breaker interface will participate in the application to control, open and close the breaker, but it's also used for a protection application or it's also used by a breaker failure application. So that's why we introduced a new element application to better describe the, the context where we can use certain functional elements. So in this example, we could introduce an application called breaker failure. And with function references, we can say to implement the application breaker failure of this breaker, we need the function element breaker failure 
itself with the logical node RBRF, but we also need the interface to the other breakers that we trip when this breaker fails. And the protection function also participates in this breaker failure application, as it, this is the function that initiates the start of this function, of this application. That's as well a new possibility introduced in 61850-6-100. All these new elements of the 6-100, and that's the additional one, power system resource reference, instead of allocating these function elements in a certain level of the hierarchy associated to equipment, we now introduced as well what we call a power system resource reference. So we can say, as an example, this logical node XCBR is associated with the breaker, but then we have another logical node XCBR associated with the phase A of that breaker, one with the phase B and one with the phase C. That's an additional new element that we introduce in the part 6-100. In the next presentation after mine, Jörg will provide you a little bit more details of this complete 6-100 and what has been added to SCL or what will be added to SCL through that extension. But now to finalize my part, I will explain a few ideas what we have further, what is further going on as discussions. Um, there is additional enhancements to the engineering and specification process that we are working on. One is a technical report that has been recently published, 90-11, where we talk about how to describe custom logic by embedding that in a logical node GAPC, but then also ways how we can describe the logic using other standards from the industry. We can use that as well for the specification if we want to specify certain functional behavior of a system. We are also working on a technical report that specifies the, no, it's a standard that specifies uh, ways to configure an HMI it's a 61850 part 6-2 that it will be. It includes a graphical configuration language and an HMI configuration language. So that's really uh, a method to completely specify the configuration of an HMI as well in a standardized way. Then we had produced already a while ago a guideline, a technical report as a guideline to describe basic application profiles. We are now working on an extension to that to describe a basic application profile in SCL. This can then later on be used as a library element and when with multiple of these basic applications profiles described in SCL already, it will be very efficient to completely specify and design a substation automation system. Uh, we already talked about the ISD, which is the ID specification description file that is expressed, uh, that is defined in the part 6-100. Uh, we also had discussions to further enhance the formal specification of an ID. So it was suggested to include more or less everything in such a specification, include everything that describes the complete requirements from a on an ID, so not only the function requirements and data model requirements, what we can do today with an ISD, but add specification of things like IO requirements, how many binary outputs do I need, uh, formal specification of environmental requirements, so referring to the part three that I introduced at the beginning, uh, logic capabilities, and a lot more. So basically the idea to completely describe what you would have in a text document to describe your device requirements, to do that completely supported by a formal specification. This work is currently on hold due to limited resources that we have in the standardization bodies. So last but not least, to summarize this introduction into the specification, 
as a general point, what we have learned, what is needed to specify a substation is largely independent of 61850. It's not everything that is completely new now when you have to do a specification. However, certain aspects of IEC 61850 may need to be specified, need to be formulated, like for any technology. But more importantly, I think, key is that 61850 provides a support to describe some aspects of a specification for a substation or any other system as a standardized machine processable specification. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video insightful and enjoyable. We post new Smart Grid related videos every Friday at 12 CET. So please go ahead and subscribe and let colleagues in other departments and peers in other organizations know so that they can benefit too. We welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to post them below. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you.